Welcome to St. Martin the Fields and welcome to the first of our 2020 autumn lectures. We're absolutely thrilled uh, to see you all here. Trust and faith are really the same thing. Trust has come to be associated with something solid and abiding, while faith has come to mean something arbitrary and unsubstantiated. But at root, they're both about how what we can expect in present and future based on what we understand about the past, whether cosmically or relationally. Our autumn lectures for 2020 begin with the recognition that a series of events and culture changes have problematized the objects of our trust and our whole sense of living in a trustworthy society and universe. The format tonight is that our speaker will address us for around 45 to 50 minutes. He'll then, um, he and I will then dialogue for 10 or 15 minutes, after which there'll be questions both online and here in person. There are microphones at either side so if you've got a question, you don't need to put your hand up. You just walk uh, to the microphone. Don't start speaking before I ask you. Um, and also, uh, but stay two meters away from the, uh, from the next person in line. <clears throat> and then also there are two people who are kindly uh, introducing questions that we get in the comments bar. Uh, so if you're, if you're online, and we're grateful to have you with us then do send in the questions and people here will read them out on your behalf. Not all of them, obviously. Tom Holland grew up loving dinosaurs and ancient civilizations. He became an outstanding writer of historical nonfiction and fiction. He's since become a TV broadcaster of great renown. If there were a chair in the public understanding of history, it would surely be his. In 2016, he wrote these intriguing words. Familiarity with the biblical narrative of the crucifixion has dulled our sense of just how completely novel a deity Christ was. Most of us who live in post-Christian societies still take for granted that it is nobler to suffer than to inflict suffering. Christianity is why we generally assume that every human life is of equal value. In my morals and ethics, I've learned to accept that I am not Greek or Roman at all, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. About 10 years ago, a, a Jewish friend of mine uh, said to me, if Christians knew the tradition in Judaism that they'd walked away from, if they truly knew what that tradition really was, they would kneel down and weep. I think the feeling you get uh, on reading Dominion, Tom's recent prize-winning book, is I wonder actually if it's written for me. I wonder if it's actually written for a contemporary secular humanist. It's kind of saying to a contemporary secular humanist, if you knew the depth of the Christian tradition and what you've walked away from, and how deeply those values in our culture that you most cherish are rooted in that tradition, you would kneel down and weep. That's more or less, the, I would say, a summary of the argument of the book. It's a magnificent account of how much our present culture derives without realizing it from 2,000 years of Christianity. In launching our series, In What Do We Trust? Pondering how historically rooted and socially located is our sense of trust, Richard Carter and I could think of no better person to invite than Tom Holland. And Tom, we're absolutely delighted you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, very generous introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and the incredible strangeness of the experience you've given me. This is um, the first time 
Uh, I've spoken to an audience not on Zoom since March. Um, I'm sure for many of you as well, it must be the first time that you have come to uh, a live event. So um, this is a very strange occasion in, in a very strange year. And in a sense, it provides the perfect context for trying to uh, answer the question that you've, 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 you've given me. Uh, in what do we trust? What, what are the lessons um, from history uh, when we try and answer that question? Because, of course, um, it's a question that lessons from the present have sharpened to an incredible degree. Here we are. We are here, presumably, because we trust that it is safe to be here. I am very aware that uh, this is the first evening on which um, groups of of more than six are not allowed to gather. And I'm no mathematician, but I think we have more than six here. But I'm trusting that that's safe and legal and okay. Equally, the fact that this is the first time that I have stood up and, and, and given a live talk for what, five months now, again reflects the fact that all of us in, in Britain, across Europe, across much of the world, have trusted the experts when they tell us that this kind of, 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 of distancing, of, of isolating, is the right thing to do. We have trusted that the government, that uh, the health service, that the epidemiologists, that the entire structure of public health in this country, we have trusted that they know what they're doing and that they have the best interests of the whole of society at heart. Now, of course, that does not mean that our trust is total. I am sure there are, are some of us here whose, whose trust in, say, the Prime Minister is not 100%. There will be some of us who trust the model set by, say, New Zealand. There will be others who trust the model set by Sweden. But all of us, I think, can have that bedrock of assurance that when we are told what to do, the people who are telling us what to do have our best interests at heart. And I think that 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 sense of a kind of common assurance is evident perhaps even in the great wave of displays of public passion and anger that swept this city and many other cities, particularly in America, over the course of the summer. Um, people marched through the streets of London in the conviction that black lives matter. People assembled on the streets of London in the conviction that all lives matter. And there is a sense that, very evident on social media, in the media, generally, um, in conversations across the country and across the world, that those two points of view, that black lives matter and that all lives matter, are somehow contrary. But of course, in effect, they are not. They rest upon a common assumption, an assumption that human dignity in the final reckoning is not dependent on race or age or background, that, that all human beings are, are equal in their standing, equal in their status. And that if we emphasize particularly that black lives matter, then that reflects a further assumption that I think most of us trust in, the assumption that uh, those who perhaps suffer discrimination or uh, poverty or disadvantage relative to others, that they perhaps 
have a special purchase on public sympathy that if privilege by definition is privileged, then so also perhaps is there privilege in the very lack of privilege, the privilege to be heard, the privilege to serve as a reproach to those who are more, assure, more assured in their, their rights, uh, in their, their inheritance of privilege. So all of these ideas that might seem to have been generating tension, conflict, disagreement over the course of this unprecedented year, when you broaden the camera out, they actually turn out to rest on, as I say, a, a, a bedrock of principles and assumptions that actually most of us whatever our political views, whatever our standpoint on the issues that surround how COVID should be treated or how Black Lives Matter should be regarded, that all of us ultimately can depend upon the idea that all of us have an inherent dignity, the idea that those who are vulnerable have a special purchase on those who are in a position to offer them help. And so I think it is uh, fair enough to ask, well, uh, where do these assumptions come from? Are they an expression of human nature? Are they an expression of principles, of values, of, of ethics that are common to people across the globe, that have been common to cultures across the span of human history? And um, in attempting to answer those questions, I can't really think of a better venue than a church that is dedicated to St. Martin. This is uh, a church that in many ways is the embodiment of the privilege that uh, the Church of England in this country has enjoyed for, for centuries now. This is the church that has the royal family as its parishioners. This is the church that stands, you know, Charing Cross is the center point of London, one of the richest cities in Europe, and St. Martin's is the church closest to that point. And yet St. Martin in the Fields is famous as well, as one of the great centers of charity and of charitable giving and of compassion in this city. I, I, I'm sad that the doors have been closed because uh, this famously is the church of the ever open door. This is the church that is, is open to everyone, to those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, and above all, those who are, hum are homeless. And the fact that um, a church so rich, historically rich, I'm sure it isn't any longer, but as was, a church that is, is, is at the heart of this wealthy, great city is also a church that is so famously committed to, uh, to helping the most disadvantaged in society reflects the influence on history and on Christian culture, specifically of the saint after whom this church is named. Um, saint Martin, Saint Martin de Tours, as his name implies, was, was not an English saint. He, uh, he grew up in Pannonia, what's now Hungary. He spent part of his life in Italy. Um, he ended up uh, as a soldier in what was then Gaul. Um, he became, uh, for long stretches of French history, the patron saint of France itself. Um, and yet here he is also the patron saint of a London church. So he is, in every way, a saint for all seasons, a saint for all people. And yet St. Martin, Martinus, 
um, met in the course of his life a man who embodied a very different, a very alien tradition. Uh, Martin served as a soldier in uh, 4th century Gaul, uh, a time when the frontiers of the Roman Empire were coming under pressure from waves of people described by the Romans as barbarians. Um, but the ultimate collapse of the empire, which would follow in the following century, was still a way off. Uh, the martial tradition of Rome remained strong, and the emperor under whom Martin is said to have served by his earliest biographer, whether he did or not is debated, but it, it certainly claimed very, very early on that he did. The emperor under whom Martin served was uh, a proficient slayer of barbarians. Um, the name of this emperor was Julian. And Julian was acclaimed Caesar partly because of his descent from a line of emperors, um, partly because he was recognized as a man of upstanding uh, principle and quality, um, but above all because of his great military record. And Julian, in the best tradition of, uh, of the Caesars, uh, showed his gratitude to his victorious soldiers with displays of, of, of immense generosity. But it was this very displays of immense generosity that enabled Martin to stand up to him. It is said that uh, after a particular victory, Julian handed out donatives to all his soldiers. But Martin, stepping forward, said that he would not accept them. Until now, he said to Julian, it is you I have served. From this moment on, I am a servant of Christ. Now, since Julian was, in the words of Christians, a pagan, someone who worshipped the traditional gods of the Mediterranean world, someone who uh, was proud to define himself as a man who stood in the long line of, of, of philosophers, this was a brave thing to say. It is said that uh, Martin was briefly threatened with death. He was spared, he was cashiered, he went on to, uh, to leave the army to uh, pursue a new life as, as a Christian leader and in due course a bishop. And so we have in this meeting between Martin, the soldier, Julian, the emperor, between the Christian and the pagan, the clash between two very different worlds, two very different ways of understanding humanity's purpose, the reason we are here on this world. Or was it? Julian was a pagan, but he was also a very complex man. Julian was a man whose hatred for Christianity, what he dismissed as the cult of the corpse of the Jew, was pretty much the animating principle that guided him in his uh, career as, as an emperor. His devotion to the ancient gods was very ostentatious. He paraded it. Uh, and his particular patron was uh, a goddess called Kibele, um, the mother goddess who sat enthroned on a mountain in Anatolia, what is now Turkey, and who in various incarnations had been worshipped for thousands and thousands of years. And it worried Julian at a time when people like Martin, soldiers, were turning to Christ, that the worship of Kibale seemed to be falling into disuse. Julian made a point when he was in Anatolia 
of going off the road up to the great shrine of Kibale and being devastated to find that it was essentially abandoned, that people were no longer going there. And Julian, um, in a manner that may not be entirely unfamiliar to, to, to the priests who are present here today, blamed it on the clergy. He said that the, the priests of Kibale were not doing their job. They were letting the side down. Specifically, Julian said, the priests of Kibale were not looking out for the poor. They were spending all their time in pubs. And so Julian made a point of granting the priests of Kibale a large amount of money to hand out to the poor and thereby to encourage people who had abandoned the worship of Kibale to return to this ancestral worship. Teach them, Julian said to the priests of Kibale, teach them that doing good works was our practice of old. Now Julian said this with a totally straight face. But the idea that the priests of Kibale, over the course of the centuries that had preceded Julian's life, had devoted themselves as acts of charity, was questionable. Essentially, what the priests of Kibale had enjoyed doing was dancing and cross-dressing. They certainly made offerings to the gods, and if you go to the now reopened British Museum, you will see what uh, one scholar has described as a pair of nutcrackers, um, a pair of uh, castration blades with which the priests of Kibale would essentially uh, castrate themselves, offering their testicles as offerings to the gods. Charity did not fit into this. Nor was charity the principle of charitable giving as Julian understood it, the idea that the poor were there to be served by those who were great, those who had wealth, those who had power. Nor was it evident in the great epics to which Julian was devoted. In the Iliad, um, it's the strong, it's the beautiful, it's the powerful, it's the regal who are the favorites of the gods. The weak, the downtrodden are despised. Nor in the philosophers to whom Ju Julian was devoted, there was no great tradition that emphasized the obligation of the rich and the wise to give to the poor in them either. The starving most philosophers taught deserved no sympathy. Beggars were best rounded up and deported. Pity risked undermining the self-control that a wise man should properly exercise. And yet Julian, devout pagan though he was, seems to have ignored all this. Julian genuinely seems to have convinced himself that the tradition of charitable giving was something that the pagan gods blessed and approved. And that this was something that the vast mass of pagan worshippers could place their trust in. The certitude that the gods cared for them, no matter how poor they were, no matter how weak, no matter how unfortunate. And so you have to ask yourself, how did Julian, a man so intelligent, so learned, how did he misunderstand the tradition that he held to so profoundly? And I think the answer is that Julian, as well as Martin, stands as evidence of how by the middle of the fourth century, just a few decades after the conversion of Constantine the Great to Christianity, just how totally Christian assumptions had come to saturate the mindset of elite Romans, of powerful Romans. 
even those who thought themselves opposed to Christianity. Julian was actually Constantine's nephew. He had been brought up a Christian um, as a child. And one of the reasons that he was so devoted to Kibale was that he believed that it was Kibale who had uh, redeemed him from the darkness as he saw it of Christian faith and brought him to the light of truth. But the paganism that Julian thought he had arrived at, the paganism that Julian thought Kibale had brought him to, was in fact far more Christian in many ways than the Christianity that was practiced by emperors who were overtly baptized. There is a quality to Julian's passion, his commitment, his certitude that, uh, that the poor can indeed trust in the beneficence of the gods, that they can indeed find that certitude in their compassion and their kindness that in many ways is, is more deeply Christian than anything that was shown, say, by Constantine. And so the meeting between Julian and Martin is not quite what it seems. It's not actually a meeting of two different, completely contradictory points of view. In fact, it is a, a meeting that bears witness to the explosive growth of a radically new way of understanding the world. And one of the reasons why Julian's attempt to restore pagan worship, to resurrect the traditional habits of worship that had been practiced across the Mediterranean world, one of the reasons why this failed why, in the end, the mass of people in the Roman Empire felt that they were no longer able to put their trust in the ancient gods, was that the argument that the divine cares for the weak and the poor was not rooted in the fabric of the myth and the philosophy that Julian held to. By contrast, the conviction of Martin that God cared for the weak was something that he could draw from the very wellsprings of his faith. And there is, of course, no story that better illustrates that than this one. And it's fantastic to be in a church where there is such a wonderful prop the story is a famous one, but it always bears retelling. It dates to a time before Martin's confrontation with Julian and his dismissal from the army. He is a soldier. It's winter. He is wearing the heavy military cloak, the capella that enables a soldier to keep warm in the winter of northern Gaul. And as he's riding out through the gate of Amiens, he sees there by the gateway, naked, half naked, shivering in the cold, a beggar. And so Martin takes his cloak, cuts it in two, gives it to the beggar. And then he rides on, thinks nothing more of it. But that night he has a dream. He dreams that Christ himself comes to him. And Christ says, you gave me your cloak today. And Martin says, when did I give you that? I didn't see you, see you, O Lord. And the Lord said to him, as he had done on earth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, 
you did for me. Martin, this ex-soldier, this provincial, this man dismissed from the ranks, this nobody, would become one of the most famous men in the Roman world. And he became famous because of stories like the one that is shown here. because he committed himself to the understanding that ultimately the poorest, the weakest, the most disadvantaged in society can place their trust in a God who, like them, has suffered, had been weak, had been poor, had been hungry, had been lacking, a cloak. And the discovery of the rich and the wealthy and the powerful in Roman Gaul, that this could be a source of power, was incredibly destabilizing. Nothing like it had been experienced before. Martin had terrible clothes, he stank. His hair, we were told, was a disgrace. He was not a man who wanted power. When the people of Tours decided that Martin should become their third bishop, and a bishop by now in the Christianized empire was a figure of great power, of great authority, a man who exercised patronage. And patronage for the Romans was the ultimate index of power. So to become a bishop was to become a very, very great man indeed. But when people decided that they wanted Martin to be their bishop, Martin ran away and were told that he hid in a barn and only became a bishop because Geese gave away his presence. And even when he became a bishop, he scorned the appurtenances of power. He refused to live in a palace. He refused to wear silken robes. He persisted in his awful haircut. And yet, the paradox, this served to his flock, to the vast mass of Christians for whom he cared, as a demonstration of the fact that he could be trusted. And so to that extent, to the silken aristocrats of Tor and of Gaul generally, this served to give them a sense that the world had been turned upside down. The traditional indices that signaled you could be trusted. Education, wealth, breeding had been turned on their heads. But a further paradox emerged over the course of the years that followed and the centuries that followed Martin's death. Because the trust that Martin's flock, the poor, the disadvantaged, the dispossessed, the trust that they had placed in Martin came to be shared by the powerful. To begin with, the, the aristocracy of Tor after Martin's death had just wanted to forget all about him. But Martin's tomb became a place of, of pilgrimage. It was said that great miracles were performed at his tomb. The power that he had exercised in life became a source of power in death. And that power in turn generated a sense not just among pilgrims who wanted to be healed or comforted, that Martin was someone to trust in. It became something that the very powerful came to believe in as well. And in time, as the Roman Empire collapsed, trust in Martin came to replace trust in the structures of 
the crumbling empire. And when in due case, the empire had fallen apart completely and the Franks had established a monarchy on the ruins of what had been the provinces of Gaul, the Frankish king himself adopted Martin as the great patron of his royal house. And the cloak that Martin had given to the beggar, the capella, became a totem of Frankish power. And special priests, capellani, chaplains, were appointed to attend it. And it was carried into war. And so the emblem of this, this man who had given away his military cloak to a beggar, who had resigned uh, his role in the army and turned to the cause of peace, became an emblem of war. And over the course of the centuries that followed, Martin himself underwent a similar transfiguration. In the 12th century, in the great monastery that had grown up uh, in the, the, the field where Martin and his followers had camped out in caves and shacks, a great monastery had arisen in its place, um, a monk uh, drew up a lineage in which he showed that Martin, this smelly bum, had in fact been of royal blood. And over the course of the centuries that followed, the cloak and Martin himself became emblems of royal power. Which is why in um, 1793, in the heyday of the French Revolution, revolutionaries turned up at Tours at the enormous complex of buildings, uh, the great center of pilgrimage, uh, so vast that it had come to be called Martinopolis. And they looked at Martin. You know, the, the uh, Martinopolis was full of, of statues, of illustrations, of emblems like this. Uh, and they saw in it an emblem of everything that they were committed to overthrow. The power of the king had become fused with the power of the church, and both were seen by the people as enemies. They had ceased to be things that they could trust in. They had become the emblems of everything that had come to be mistrusted. And in the autumn of 1793, against the backdrop of a counter-revolution to, uh, to the west of Tor, uh, Martin, the, uh, the great sanctuary, the great basilica of, Mar of San Martin was, was stripped bare. Statues were toppled. Fittings were taken away. Iron was melted down. A sanctuary can do without a grill, one of the revolutionaries declared, but the defense of the fatherland cannot do without pikes. Three weeks after the process of despoliation had begun, everything had vanished, and the basilica itself was converted into a stable. And yet, by a paradox that seems to run throughout Christian history, it sometimes seems that almost every aspect of Christian history is an expression of, of paradox. The man that the revolutionaries were overthrowing was an expression of the values and the assumptions that had powered the overthrow of the monarchy and the assault on the Basilica of St. Martin itself. Martin too had been a destroyer of idols. He had been a scourge of privilege. He had been a scorner of the mighty. Martin too, like the revolutionaries, had been a sans culotte. There he is, giving away the clothing, the emblems of his status.
And that in turn suggests a, a paradox that again, I think, um, has been fundamental to the revolution that Christianity represents. That if we're, we're, we're saying, what can we trust? The truth is that the values and the assumptions of Christianity that England, Britain, Europe have placed their trust in for so long are themselves and have been a source of immense instability. It's as though Christian civilization is like San Francisco, built on the San Andreas Fault. There may be decades, centuries, where nothing much happens. Great buildings rise, great institutions spread, great wealth emerges, and then there is a great convulsion and a shaking and everything comes down. And the process of destruction, the process of instability, in itself, it's the source of that that we for centuries, millennia, have put our trust in, and which explains the paradox that destruction can be creative, and that often it is when a society seems most stable that it is most ready to go through one of its periodic convulsions. I think that the story of St. Martin, this rebel who becomes an icon of, of power and of monarchy and who gets toppled by people who are opposed to power and monarchy and yet who himself is clearly part of the inheritance of assumptions and values that had inspired the overthrow of his shrine. I think that, that his story points to what it is within our society that we trust. Ultimately, we put our trust in assumptions that cannot help but perpetually challenge us, cannot but perpetually unsettle us. And if we want to know just how utterly saturated by those assumptions we are, we only need to look at the example of the one regime that has been constructed and raised in what was once Christendom since the time of Constantine that sought to overturn it. The French Revolution sought to overturn doctrinal Christianity, institutional Christianity, the Christianity of basilicas and relics. But it didn't seek to overturn the founding assumptions of Christianity, quite the contrary. It was powered by them. It would not have happened without them. But if we want the example of a regime that did turn its back, not just on institutional Christianity, but the animating values and assumptions of Christianity, then we can look at the Nazis. The Nazis, of course, were opposed to the assumption that all human beings are created equal. They completely thought that the differences between black and white are fundamental. Paul's teaching that there is no Jew or Greek was anathema to them. They founded genocide on their rejection of that teaching. And likewise, the foundational message of Christianity, evident in the figure of Christ on the cross, the idea that the slave can conquer the master, that the tortured can overcome the torturer, that the weak can overcome the strong, that Martin himself demonstrated so potently when he took off the symbol of his military status and gave it to a beggar. That idea 
that the strong have a duty of care to the weak and that the weak, by virtue of their weakness, may have a strength that is greater than that of the strong, that again was anathema to the Nazis. And the fact that within living memory, an attempt to repudiate those fundamental values that have structured Christian society and post-Christian society equally, the shock of that remains something so vivid that in a sense, we no longer need overt Christian teaching because all we have to do rather than ask what would Jesus do is look at the Nazis and say what would Hitler do and then do the opposite. And that perhaps is why it can seem so hard for us in this strange year to find a sense of certainty, to be, uh, a definite foundation, a definite mooring for values and assumptions that we feel deeply, but which nevertheless seem to be free-floating. They seem to be founded on an assumption that we should do whatever Nazis, we should do the opposite of whatever Nazis would do. And they're founded on an assumption that values that previously, practices, ethics, values that previously had been taught by the church uh, have now become so much a part of the welfare state, the hospitals, the schools that were organized by the church uh, are, are now, we take them for granted. That we can all share in fundamentally Christian values and ethics and be complete atheists, complete humanists, uh, regard Christian faith as nonsense, as superstition. And so I think what this strange, unsettling year has, has revealed is that although what we put our trust in as a society is in fact very culturally contingent, um, very much the consequence of specifically Christian history, Christian theology, Christian teachings, Christian scriptures. We no longer need Christianity if we are to trust in them. And whether that is a, a source of strength for our society or not is an open question. But it does much, I think, to explain the cu peculiar blend of um, the way in which we have simultaneously, all of us, taken so much for granted this year and yet at the same time seemed unable to agree about anything. We have this vast inheritance in which we place our trust and yet at the same time so many of us have lost faith that the relationship between that trust and between faith I think is generating all kinds of fascinating tensions, the swirl of which are surrounding us, even as I stand here. Thanks very much. Well, what a, what a feast uh, and what a treat. Um, I guess my job is to ask Tom uh, to tell us about the 17 centuries that you missed out in that story uh, because it was uh, an absorbing account. Obviously, uh, for the Vicar of St. Martin in the Fields, it's rather gratifying to feel that the 
patron saint of one's church is possibly the most seminal figure, at least in the first millennium of Christian history, if not in the whole of Christian history. I, I take that as a rather gratifying contribution, so thanks for that very much. Um, and then we skip straight to the Nazis. Uh, and I, I've never heard that um, description of the values of liberal democracy quite so acutely put that we basically believe in doing the opposite of what Adolf Hitler would have done. I think that's a wonderfully succinct but apt summary of a kind of gut feeling uh, and, and it helps to explain why, for example, anti-Semitic attacks uh, aren't just a deep problem for Jews but send a shiver through the whole of society and I think that's a really helpful uh, little description uh, of what the values of contemporary society are when, when placed on that uh, visceral level. I, I, guess, I guess my real job, uh, Tom, is to, uh, is to push you a little bit more on, uh, first of all, the, our contemporary situation. Uh, I won't use the you word, you used it once, uh, that we all use about this year of all the, 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 the instances that we've never faced before. But to reflect on trust in this contemporary situation, but also, are there any parts, and you must have thought about this a great deal as you, uh, as you wrote Dominion, are there any, any jarring notes in that narrative? Are there any features that you see are perhaps highlighted by the pandemic uh, that don't accord with that harmonious heritage that you portrayed so, uh, so lucidly for us tonight. Are there any things that it perhaps disturb you or are there any things that are in our culture that are wonderful, good and true but aren't derived from that Christian heritage? Well, I, I think that um, part of the problem with, with answering that question is that our, our assumptions about what are good and bad <laughs> are themselves Christian. So um, I, I, I think that, um, that, that, that to a degree, uh, atheism and, and humanism um, within the West are kind of the logical endpoints of, of a tradition within Christianity and perhaps specifically of Protestantism that um, rejects superstition, um, you know, banishes the, uh, the, the, the sacred from, from, uh, from the landscape, from, um, uh, from the world around us, sends it up into the sky and then ultimately it kind of dissolves completely. Um, And it leaves, just, just as um, part of the, uh, the narrative of pro Protestant propaganda is to, um, is to cast the Catholic Church as, as a kind of re repository of, of superstition and idolatry that has to be overturned. So Enlightenment thinkers, um, atheists, humanists now have turned those weapons against Christianity itself. Um, and the the arguments that are always brought up against um, Christianity, um, whether, whether Christianity has been uh, for good or evil, um, the Crusades, um, the Spanish Inquisition, um, wh wh why, do, why do we condemn the Crusades? Because um, they inflict violence on the innocent. Uh, why do we regard the infliction of violence as problematic um, because Christ said, <laughs> put up your sword, because Martin walked out on the army. That tradition of Christian pacifism is one that um, people who would regard Christianity as inherently violent and militant have, have absorbed. And likewise, um, the Spanish Inquisition, what is it that is so shocking about uh, the sentencing to death by 
um, a body of priests of innocent people. Um, you know, what is it within Christian culture that might inspire a sense of, of horror and revulsion at that? Well, you know, you just have to look at the central image of Christianity, the image of a man nailed to a cross, um, to, to, to get your answer for that. So I think it's very, very, very difficult, uh, as Nietzsche famously pointed out, for critics of Christianity to escape Christian assumptions. And the attempt to, to do that again, as the influence of Nietzsche on the Nazis demonstrates, can lead to some quite dark places. Um, I, I do think that one of the things that, um, that, that, that Nazism demonstrated, and you, you, you mentioned anti-Semitism, the, the consciousness among, among all those who would define themselves as Christian or as culturally Christian, um, that that anti-Semitism has been the great blot on Christian history and the Christian record, I think is, is one that um, unsettles certain key Christian assumptions. And the reason for that, again, goes back to that famous statement by Paul, that in Christ there is no Jew or Greek. Um, that, 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 that principle that, that the Nazis rejected so violently and which to an extent is kind of what underpins um, the assumptions of, of Western universalism. It underpins the assumptions of, of, uh, of the multicultural society we, we, we have in Britain. The idea that, 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 that all are essentially are one. Because uh, as Paul himself painfully discovered, um, there were plenty of Jews who actually did not want to have their distinctiveness dissolved into a kind of universalist mush as they saw it. And so the, um, the question of um, what Christians and the universalists who have followed in Christians, what Christianity's wake do with people who reject their summons to enjoy a universal peace is, as it has always been, an incredibly live question. And I think that another reason for the decline of, of um, doctrinal Christianity in its, its Western heartlands has been precisely a sense of anxiety about the totalizing claims of Christianity, about the claims of Christianity to uh, a universal um, status because we, we've seen where, where that can lead. Um, and so Christianity is rejected for the deeply Christian reason that it's become hegemonic, which is yet another of that snarl of paradoxes that seems to, to, to stalk every conversation of the role that Christianity has played through history. So to take the logic of your argument further, and I'll, I'll, this will be my last question, then I'll start inviting ones from you guys. Um, a strong Islam in this country is actually good for the renewal of Christianity because it gets Christianity out of the mindset that it's simply the normal. Uh, and, and, and so, in a sense, it, it, it provides an explanation why uh, populists in places like Hungary, who present a kind of Christian normal as a reason for putting up barriers against Islam, whether it's Turkey joining the EU. Fancy someone try wanting to join the EU, what a thought. Uh, or whether it's uh, refugees coming into the country. Uh, that, that actually the, the poverty of that argument is, would be offset by a, a truly uh, a ho, a true hospitality to Islam as, if you like, the uh, principal alternative, although I guess uh, maybe there, you would say there are, there are many overlaps, but, uh, but there's the principal alternative worldview to Christianity globally. Well, uh, th th there are, again, um, there, 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 you know, there are two, 
I think, principal traditions that, that, that Christianity today is heir to in its attitudes to, to Islam and to, um, to other uh, frameworks of belief that, that might be thought antithetical to Christianity. Um, the first of these, of course, is, is absolutely embodied by, by Martin, um, caring for the beggar, uh, and the model for that is self-evidently the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan isn't just that the, the, the Samaritan cares for the wayfarer who's fallen among thieves in his hour of need, but that the, the, the wayfarer is a Jew, and that relations between Samaritans and Jews are notoriously hostile. Um, so the whole point of that is that the Christian message um, is, is not just for Christians, that the, the obligation Christ gives to care for the wretched and the oppressed is for everybody. And that was something that was understood right from the beginning, um, all the way through, you know, and indeed, in the, in, in the third century, a time of, of terrible pandemic, kind of blending the, the, uh, the virulence of, of, of COVID with the, the revolting uh, symptoms of, of, of Ebola, a plague that raged across the Roman Empire for, 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 for almost 20 years. Um, it was the willingness of Christians to care for not just other Christians, but those who were not Christians, that, that did a great deal to raise the profile of Christianity and to... Um, and to boost its prestige. So that's, that, that, that's a very, very ancient, constant tradition. Against that, there is absolutely the sense that Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that um, you know, there are enough instances in both the Old and the New Testament of uh, people who refuse to accept the word of God and the martial response that uh, this generates. Um, to encourage people to feel that um, you know, if people uh, won't become Christian, then they should be forced to become Christian. And that also is absolutely uh, part of the tradition that goes back a very, very long way. Uh, I mean, in the West, the, um, the tradition goes all the way back to Charlemagne, who, um, whose approach to uh, the pagans in Saxony was, um, well, it, let's say it wasn't very ecumenical. It, it involved mass baptism and uh, the slaughter of anyone who, who dared to repudiate it. So that also is part of the tradition. And so the, the, the articulation of Christian principle that both Angela Merkel, when she let a million refugees in, and Viktor Orban, where he put the barbed wire fences up and said that we're going to keep hungry Christian, these are both part of the inheritance of Christianity. And Islam, of course, represents a peculiar challenge, as it always has done, again, right from the beginning, because Islam has inherited from Christianity the would-be universalism. Christ says to his disciples, go to the ends of the earth, preach the gospel. Muslims come to believe that um, Islam is the final revelation. It's the last chance that God is giving to humanity and that unless the whole of humanity accepts it, then humanity is, 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 is lost. And there is no way that both of those can be true. So, <laughs> there's a challenge. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, I think that, that Islam within Britain has been massively Christianized, mm -hmm. massively Protestantized in particular, because what Islam, like, like every faith system, that exists within Britain has become, it, it, we say there's freedom of religion in Britain, and so there is. People are, are, are free to practice their beliefs as religions. But that is not how Jews and Muslims say traditionally had understood what they belonged to. Jews up until the time of the French Revolution thought of themselves as a people. They were the nation of Israel. And the condition of Jews becoming citizens, French citizens, they become French citizens, they're no longer allowed really to think of themselves as belonging to a nation called Israel. Uh, they can practice their, what, what Christians had been calling Judaism since the second century, but no Jew had ever done, is something that, that Jews have to start thinking that they belong to. They have to think that they belong to a religion called Judaism, which is something completely new for Jews. And again, when Muslims in, in, in 
started coming to Europe in large numbers, they were told you can have freedom of religion. But again, most Muslims over the course of, of, of Muslim history had thought of themselves as an ummah, as a people. They did not think of themselves as belonging to something called religion that could be separated from something called the secular. But to have freedom of religion in a Western country obliges people from non-Christian traditions to accept that Christian concept of the secular and the concept of there being religions that exist kind of separately from the secular. Um, and most Jews, most Muslims indeed have accepted that. And so over the course of the decades, centuries in the case of, 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 of Jews, there's been a weathering effect and they have become to that degree more Christianized. Thank you, tremendous. Um, okay, this is it. Uh, I'm not seeing a long queue of people behind each microphone. So uh, I, I don't know how we, oh, look, just like that. Here they come. This is like being Billy Graham, isn't it? This is just some people just come forward. No, come as you are. There are, there are there's literature at the front. There will be people to, sorry, shouldn't do that. Uh, go ahead. And, and I think um, Kath and Ben will emerge in similar fashion. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Hi. Do uh, take your mask off to speak. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was wondering if it could be argued that Christian ideology is not Christian ideology, but more human ideology. The idea of what is good and bad predates Christianity. Uh, so if we look at the myth of Balkis and Philemon, the idea of, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, that you have to let a stranger into your house, the rules of hospitality. And uh, in the myth, uh, Bacchus and Philemon, who are not very wealthy, let the Greek gods, not knowing that, that it's the Greek gods, into their home um, as beggars. And they still help out and they are rewarded, uh, which really reminds me of uh, St. Mark's story. So could it be argued that these are not Christian values, but human values? Thank you. I'll take Martin's as well. That's our tradition here. We tend to take more than one question at a time, partly to give the speaker a time, time to, to think about a response. Uh, Martin, you go ahead, and then, uh, yeah, uh, Martin, you go. Ahead. Okay, so maybe I'll approach it from the other way around. So rather than being universal values, I wonder, you spoke about how uh, Christianity swept away a lot of the assumptions of the Roman Empire and the values on which it was founded. What I suspect is that a lot of secular humanists and atheists today believe that a lot of their values originate from the Enlightenment. And I wondered, and whereas you're pointing out how much of what we have today is actually Christian values and assumptions, and I just wondered, is there anything uh, that, the, like the Christians superseded or swept away from the Romans, have the uh, Enlightenment values actually did they create anything new? Was there anything novel from them? And have those persisted, or at least at a minimum, really significantly changed what we would understand to be Christian values? Okay, happy to take those two yeah. together, yeah. Tom. Yeah, there, 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 were, there, there were certainly traditions in antiquity that um, uh, travelers, um, foreigners, um, guests from other countries should be uh, afforded hospitality um, and you, you, of course counterpointing to the, um, the, the the contempt for for the poor that you get in the Iliad in the Odyssey you, you get when when Odysseus appears to be a, um, a beggar he gets welcomed by by the swine herd um, so, 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 so definitely there are kind of traditions of hospitality that are are part of the fabric of um, of, of the classical world. But I think that, that what, is, what is radically different about, about the Christian um, perspective on this is that um, the beggars, the starving, the hungry have a moral value in and of themselves. And that um, ultimately, if you want to be close to Christ, then you have to care for those who are closest to Christ, who are the poor. And that is a radical subversion of the almost universal assumption in the classical world that 
uh, moral value is to be equated with um, physical beauty, with, um, with, with breeding, with strength, uh, with, um, with all the attributes of, of greatness. And the idea that um, someone is to be commemorated because of, of, of the, the concern he showed for a nameless beggar is something that is utterly shocking and subversive to, um, to an antiquity that, that essentially took for granted that, that, that beggars certainly were a nuisance and they should be you know, scoured out of, out, out of, out of cities. Um, there is, in, uh, of, of course, in, in the classical world, a sense of, of civic responsibility. The Roman Empire has provided um, doles to the people. Um, there is a sense of, of, of commonality in classical cities among all its various citizens. But the essence of Christian teaching is that this should be universal. And it, 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 it's that, I think, that underpins, by and large, the values that... Um, that, 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 that people in the West today kind of take for granted and assume a human nature, which brings us neatly on to the Enlightenment. Um, I, I think that the, the whole... the whole mythology of the Enlightenment, the whole... Um, the whole way it frames the world is inconceivable without the context that is provided by Christianity. Uh, and I think that that is evident in the very word we use to describe it, enlightenment, because um, it is drawing on traditions that are very, very manifest, particularly among uh, radical Protestants in the Netherlands, in Britain, um, you know, which provides the kind of smithy for the early enlightenment, that... Um, that enlightenment is a, is, is a coming of the spirit into the heart. That you are enlightened by the movement of the spirit that enables you to see what had not previously been visible. Um, so the people who walked in darkness are, are brought into light. And that tradition which blends with the idea that, that superstition is something to be overthrown, that idols are something to be toppled, um, again, is drawing very clearly, I think, on the inheritance of, of, of the Reformation, propaganda of the Reformation, which in turn, of course, even though the, Ref the, the Reformation is, set, is setting the Roman church as the great adversary, um, the early missionaries of the Roman church had embodied as well. Um, so Boniface going to the, the forests of Saxony um, decades before Charlemagne slaughters them all, he's chopping down the trees in, that are sacred to the, the gods of the Saxons. He's toppling their idols. He is bringing light into the darkness of those pagan woods as he sees it. Um, and he is following the example of Martin, who did the same, who, 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 who toppled idols and uh, sought to banish superstition and to bring people into light. And ultimately, that in turn is drawing on the inheritance of Hebrew scriptures, the teaching of the Hebrew prophets that uh, the idols of, of Egypt and Babylon are just stock and stone, and that um, the worship of, of, of these gods is, 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 is superstition to, to, to be banished. So I think um, to, to that extent, the, the assumptions of the Enlightenment precisely because they cast themselves as a repudiation of what had gone before, are in fact all the more um, a continuation of them. Um, there is one, one aspect of Enlightenment thought, however, that I think does repudiate Christian teaching, and it's quite a topical one, uh, in light of um, the uh, decision of the University of Edinburgh over the weekend to um, change the name of David Hume Tower on the basis that um, Hume regarded... Um, Africans as, uh, by nature, uh, inferior to Europeans, which was quite a popular uh, opinion among many Enlightenment thinkers from Voltaire to Kant. And the reason that, for instance, Voltaire was able to think this was because Voltaire thought that uh, humans had um, emerged in various different races. 
because he rejected the uh, Genesis account of um, the creation of Adam and Eve and the teaching um, in Genesis amplified by Paul that um, all human beings are created in the image of God and that therefore ultimately, you know, as Paul says, there is no Jew or Greek. Um, Voltaire didn't subscribe to that and so he was able to believe that um, there are indeed different races and that some of these races may be inferior to others. And so really the, it, it, it's the Enlightenment that, that gives birth to what by the end of the 19th century is becoming a, a, a doctrine of scientific racism. Um, and I think the repudiation of that is witness to the failure of that dimension of Enlightenment thinking to overcome the much more deeply rooted Christian assumption that there is a, a, a fundamental shared dignity that all human beings have, no matter where they come from, no matter the colour of their skin. Thank you. Um, Kath is, is here and she's going to speak on behalf of the estimated five million people joining us online who, who are due her voice. Could you give us a couple of highlights from them and then we'll see where we go with those after which we'll go to Wendy. I have a question here on behalf of Duncan McCall. For so much of its history, the Christian church has backed the wrong horse. Supporting slavery for 17 centuries is but one example. Many others could be given, including the church's treatment of women and gay people. How do examples of that sort fit with Tom's thesis that the assumption that all lives are equal is at the heart of Christian belief? Can you give us another one? I'll give you one more, yeah. This is from Fiona McMillan. Is there not a fair difference between what's at the heart of Christian belief and actual Christian belief? actual Christian practice. So whilst the opposite of Hitler would be to practice radical acceptance of others, to practice radical acceptance of others, that's a long way from what's at the heart of UK society. Okay, similar, couple of si similar-ish questions. Yeah. So I'll take one more from over here, if I may. I just like to take you back to the specific example of um, the difference between Angela, Angela Merkel and Viktor Orban's treatment of uh, Syrian refugees and ask you to explain again how both of those come from Christian assumptions. And if that's true and they result in such different behaviours, should we be trusting in those assumptions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, how, how, why has Christianity seemingly backed wrong horses like um, uh, slavery, um, oppression of women, um, oppression of gay people? Um, well, I think first of all, we have to ask, well, why do we think that these are the wrong horses to have backed? Um, most people, for instance, for most of history, have assumed that slavery is entirely natural. Um, Aristotle widely held to be the, the, the greatest of ancient philosophers, the most influential, um, thought that slavery was entirely natural, that there were people who were natural slaves, there were people who were natural masters. Obviously, Aristotle, being a Greek, thought that the Greeks were the natural <laughs> masters and that the barbarians were the natural slaves. But that is uh, something that, 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 by and large, people for, for, for most of history have, have pretty much taken for granted. Um, Christianity has always regarded slavery as an evil, um, but it didn't see itself as um, a, a campaign for social reform to begin with. Um, it, it had its eyes fixed on heaven. And so slavery was, was seen as part of the common stock of ills that had followed the fall, um, disease, hunger, uh, inequality, suffering generally, that this was, this was part of what fallen humanity was heir to. Um, and it, it took time for people to follow through the implications of the fact that Christ, by dying on the cross, had suffered the death that was um, distinctively applied to slaves. Crucifixion was the fate that was paradigmatically visited on slaves. 
And so as early as the fourth century, you have um, a bishop called Gregory of Nyssa pointing this out and saying that the whole institution of slavery, therefore, um, is, is something evil, should be abolished. Um, it's not something that gets picked up because uh, Gregory's own brother, Basil, Basil of Caesarea, um, famous the humanitarian bishop, says, well, if, if we free the slaves, then um, who will look after them? So Basil kind of casts it as a, as a form of um, very paternalistic welfare. Um, but the sense that, that slavery is something problematic, evil, does kind of shadow uh, Christian thinking, Christian practice over the course of, 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 of its evolution. And I think it's important to emphasize that um, what we call Christianity is a kind of matrix of paradox and change. It is not something that is stable. And you can see that you know, in non-Christian terms as, as, as the, the working out of contradictions within the fabric of Christianity itself, within the ideology, the scriptural teaching, whatever. Um, or if you're a Christian, you can see it as the manifestation of the spirit moving its way through the course of human history. And by the 17th century, that is something that becomes a, a very important perspective. The people who first begin to express in large numbers the opinion that slavery is, is a moral evil that has to not just be um, put up with, but has to be abolished, are Protestants with a very radical understanding of the spirit. Um, the idea that, that what is written in scripture, for instance, it's not there on the page that matters, it's the interaction between the enlightened um, Christian, the Christian who has received grace, and what is said on the page. And it's that that enables Christians over the course of the 17th and particularly the 18th century increasingly to argue that even though the Bible nowhere says that the institution of slavery is evil, nevertheless, that is what the Bible says. And I think that, that, that part of, of, of what leads the drive of abolitionism through the 18th century is, is that precisely that kind of radically Protestant understanding of, of where the spirit can lead you. The other is the fact that um, with Anglo-American slavery, Atlantic slavery, it becomes racialized in a way that it hadn't been before. And that, again, imposes immense strain or strains on Christian belief. It's okay for people like Voltaire, who thinks that different races were created at different times. It's not a problem. But for anyone who thinks that all human beings were created um, equally in the image of God and therefore have an inherent dignity, the fact that um, slaves in the plantations in the Caribbean and America are all African becomes a massive problem. And there are attempts to kind of justify this, saying, you know, that... that um, one of the sons of Noah was cursed and therefore it makes it fine. But nobody's really convinced by this. And essentially the strain of it is what precipitates this extraordinary kind of blaze uh, of, of, of abolitionism that, that, that within the space of very few decades sweeps not just um, Britain, but, but the entire world. And um, we now are in the position where we look back and we cannot imagine that anyone ever thought that slavery was acceptable. Um, kind of expression of just how dramatically, I guess, if you, if you want to see it this way, the spirit has been able to change and transform and purge humanity. Uh, on, on, on the, the, the theme of, um, of, uh, of, of, of women and, um, and gay rights, I think uh, is, is complex, partly because the very idea of um, homosexuality, it, again, is a deeply Christian one. It's not a category that would have meant anything to, uh, say, a Roman. Um, that's not how people saw the world. The, the, the idea that uh, the world can be divided into heterosexuals and homosexuals is, 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 is one, again, it's a slow burn that, that, that only emerges after many, many kind of cycles of, 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 of evolution over the course of human history. The words are only coined in the late 19th century. Um, but how, and, and, and the word homosexuality, when it, when it does come to, uh, to, to be coined, it's coined by um, a, a, a Catholic um, a psychiatrist, psychologist, who um, essentially combines the Christian sin of sodomy with the Christian virtue of marriage. And so that's why it's always been a you know, problem for Christians to decide 
you know, are they against the, 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 the sodomy aspect or are they in favor of the marriage aspect? Um, and certainly, I, I think that, of, of course, it, there are aspects of, of feminism and of gay rights that present huge problems for Christians, particularly if they are, 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 are drawing on the Bible and on, on the inheritance of, of the great inheritance of Christian teaching. Um, and I think that um, we can see where the gay rights movement, where feminism came from, certainly in the Anglo-American world, from the fact that they emerge in the 60s and they emerge in the wake of the civil rights movement, which is a very overtly Christian movement. Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King, is uh, essentially summoning white Christians in America to recognize the dignity and equality of their black brothers and sisters. And the civil rights movement works because um, essentially uh, enough white American Christians recognize the force of what they're saying. So the civil rights movement absolutely goes with the grain of, um, of mainstream Christian teaching. What happens in the 60s is that feminists and gay rights campaigners are influenced by the success of the civil rights movement and apply it to their own causes. So they are drawing on kind of Christian inheritance of campaigning, Christian assumptions about um, the right of the historically oppressed to receive justice. But because they are articulating uh, assumptions that many mainstream Christians find offensive, the pedigree the Christian pedigree of their beliefs comes to be obscured and we arrive at the situation that we have now particularly in America where uh, you, it seems that you have a block of Christians and a block of uh, anti-Christians, um, a block of conservatives and a block of radicals but the truth is that again <laughs> this isn't a war of, of, of Christianity against anti-Christians, this is a civil war within Christianity, this is an argument about um, about what aspect of the inheritance of Christianity you choose to emphasize. And that's the answer that I would, I would give to you, is that um, Christianity is not a coherent body of logical uh, formulations or laws that all knit together and make perfect sense. It's, it's a vast complex of contradictory teachings. <laughs> that generates sparks that people historically have disagreed with. And the, 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 the difference between Merkel and Orban, again, is one that, as I said, is one that runs throughout Christian history. Do you love your enemy or do you convert him at the point of a sword? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there, Tom, because that, uh, I, although I'd like to listen to you for the rest of the evening. Sorry, I'm just I apologize, take, I'm going on. I'm gonna take, there's three people standing up. I want to honor the standers. Um, we'll alternate you first, and then from this side, and then the last person. Um, one sentence each, I'm afraid. No, no long thesis now. We're into the last seconds. And then one sentence replies each, if that's all right. <laughs> Actually, my best. Yourself. It's like the end of, end of any questions, yeah. you know, like that sort of... Kind of radio for the panel left. show. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so off you go. Um, following on from the Enlightenment, would you say that the Declaration of Human Rights following the French Revolution strengthened the concept of human rights or made it seem more like a construct that was quite wobbly at the time? What a wonderful question. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Well, so, yeah, do, okay. Yeah, I, go, I, I think I, the, the, the doctrine of human rights derives from um, uh, the 12th century theology, the genius of the West in its age of power has been to pretend that its culturally contingent values and beliefs are somehow universal. And the Declaration of Human Rights and the, the UN Charter are the kind of apogee of that. And part of, of, of why the West is finding the 21st century so dislocating is that as its, as its um, economic and military power retreats, so its cultural and ideological power retreats as well, and values like human rights that, that people in the West, by virtue of their privileged status as uh, members of the leading civilization in the world, had been able to assume were universal, we can no longer do that. We have to recognize that they come from a distinctive cultural soil. It was a long sentence, but what a magnificent one. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Your, your turn next. Yeah, thank you so much for such a stimulating and enjoyable evening. I don't know if I can squeeze it into a sentence, but it was basically a question about um, the relationship between the Christian world and the ancient world as a historian of both. 
and how you understand not merely the contrast between them, but the generative qualities of that exchange? Um, I, I, I think that the, the relationship of Athens and Jerusalem is obviously, it has been a cause of, 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 of tension and, and debate, again, right from the beginning. Um, I, I think that, of course, all, all, all kinds of dimensions of, of, the, of the classical world did pass into Christianity, and indeed you could argue that, um, that Christianity, far from destroying uh, the Roman heritage, as Gibbon argued, in fact was, was the prime agent in, in preserving it. But having said that, and I'm aware this is a very, very long sentence again, um, I think that when you, what Christianity does is to transform our understanding of what the ancient world was so profoundly that it takes an enormous, enormous effort of will and, 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 and awareness to see the world as the Greeks and the Romans saw it. Um, we, we, we don't recognize the degree to which we've become Christian. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like we've breathed in the asbestos so much you know we can't we can't rid ourselves of it um and one of the reasons why i wrote dominion was precisely the the, the, the realization that that i was kind of struggling to articulate what it was that was distinctive and strange about the classical world about rome about greece using english because english is absolutely saturated in, in Christian assumptions. Every time you use a word like religion or secular or indeed homosexuality, you're engaging in anachronism because you're importing Christian categories and concepts that would have meant nothing to the pre-Christian world. Thank you, and? Thank you. The, you mentioned the Greco-Roman beliefs, one of which being that the beautiful or the strong are more virtuous, and you say that these have been superseded in a way by the Christian, by Christian beliefs that this is not the case, that people are equal. There seem to be, I don't know if you've had anybody try to sell you something, they do not sell you new perfume by advertising it with a beggar. They sell you a beautiful woman, they sell you a strong man. How do, I quite like living in a society which at least on the surface, you know, at least attempts to counter this by stating repeatedly that all human beings are equal in dignity and value. How do you do this without an established Christian church? How do you, how do you keep that going? How do I keep that going? Thank you. A bit of a miserable I, one to end on. No, no, it's, it's I, actually I, right I, at the heart of the, of I th the evening, I, th I, I think. think it's a brilliant question yeah. because it highlights the, 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 the strangeness, the weirdness of Christianity. Um, I, I, you know, the, 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 the contrast between, um, a, you know, a statue of Apollo or Aphrodite and the, the high medieval representations of Christ, twisted and, 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 and whip-flecked, nailed to a cross, are horrible. And, and it, 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 it seems obvious, it seems natural that we prefer the healthy and the strong and the beautiful. And so that just makes Christianity all the weirder that it triumphs so completely when, when it argued the opposite. Um, and you know, over the course of Christ, so just like the, um, the, the, the Frankish monarchy enshrining as a totem of war the, uh, the, the, the cloak of Martin and, and, and redrafting Martin as a kind of a, 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 a figure of royal stature. So also, are we always bound to, to praise the beautiful and admire the beautiful and be envious of the beautiful? Because that's human nature. It's kind of testimony to the enduring hold of Christian assumptions that we remain kind of slightly anxious about that, nervous about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, brings our evening uh, almost to an end. I've got a few things to say to you uh, before I let you go. Uh, first of all, that our next lecture is pre-recorded, Rowan Williams, uh, 7 p.m., Monday, 5th of October, so there won't be a gathering here at St. Martin's for that one. But the two subsequent ones, the next live lecture is 7 p.m. Monday, the 12th of October, Neil McGregor, and then Paula Gooder, 7 p.m. here, again live, Monday, 2nd of November. So don't miss any of those. Then to say that there is opportunity to give in the plate if you'd like to support this series and 
Uh, the rather perilous finances of St. Martin's at the moment. There's an opportunity to give in the plate if you're here in person. You can text capital letters LECTURE to 70085, LECTURE to 70085 uh, to donate five pounds. Or uh, you can look online, if you're joining us online, on the Facebook live stream. Or you can go home from here pick up the repeat of the live stream, and then listen all the way till the end till I give you that text number again. That's another opportunity. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Do buy uh, this book here, Tom Holland Dominion, which covers uh, some, but not all of the ground that Tom covered tonight. I really do recommend it. It's an absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful read. Um, and I want to finish, uh, obviously, by, by thanking Tom. Uh, I think the two things I want to thank you for most of all, Tom, is that listening to you, like reading your books, um, fills you with a kind of puffed-up pride, fills me with a kind of puffed-up puffed pride. I want to talk to a number of people in the next hour so I can pass off as mine all the extraordinary insights you've shared with us tonight, and I can say, oh, no, no, I've done the research. Um, I, can, I can be sure of that. And, and, um, and the connections that you've made, particularly, if I may say so, in, the, in these last few questions, both the ability to, you know, insert so many semicolons in a single sentence, and, <laughs> and, and also, but to, to get to the heart of the issues of our society in a way that I, I think most of us tonight just haven't really seriously thought about before, and yet has been staring us in our face all our lives. So thank you for that, but also thank you in a place that, you know, was built by a king and, as you pointed out, is, you know, has the Buckingham Palace and its parish and so on, uh, and, and in so ways is so much part of the establishment as St. Martin the Fields for reminding us tonight of the, of the strangeness of Christianity and the way it cuts against so many of our instincts uh, and, and takes us to a dangerous and yet wonderful place. Thanks for the reminder of that, which I think we all need. We're so grateful to you. It's just been a fabulous evening, wonderful dialogue, fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.